All right, it's pretty ominous. What shall come to pass? Are any of y'all nervous about what shall come to pass? Let me give you a hint. Since y'all are here, this is uh, the, the message that we actually get this title and it will come to pass. And you're going to find it's not quite as ominous uh, as, uh, as the bumper shows us. This actually comes, uh, the idea of this series, we are going through the minor prophets and the um, the idea of the series came from something Jesus says at the end of Luke. At the end of the book of Luke, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. People are downcast, and he meets some people, and, he's, and he, gets a, he gets the scripture, and he starts. It says he tells them all that was con- uh, concerning about him, starting with Moses, the law, and the prophets. And so Jesus says, you know when you read all those books or you don't read those books and you just kind of go through them real quickly in your Bible plan, uh, when, you, uh, when you skip over those books, you are skipping over stories of me is what Jesus says. And so we're going to actually read uh, the verse where we took the title and it shall come to pass uh, today. And today we're doing a, a book that I have thought about preaching for quite a while. The book today is the book of... Joel, that is right. So the uh, subcontext for the, or uh, subheader for this is the gospel according to Joel, the prophet, not the preacher. Okay, so that's the, that's the nuance here. If I refer to uh, Joel in the, the third person, I am not being arrogant. I would never do that. So if I ever say, as the prophet Joel says, I'm not making some idiom about myself saying something wise. Okay, so who is the prophet Joel? The prophet Joel, uh, the truth is, uh, if you would right now say, how many of us know something about the prophet Joel other than his name, and you do not raise your hand, uh, you're in line with pretty much every Bible scholar as well, because most Bible scholars, we don't know much about the prophet Joel at all. The thing we know about him is he had a dad. We know that, because he starts off in the first, first verse, he says, uh, it says that Joel had a dad, and his name was Pethuel, okay? And all we know is that's his dad's name. We don't know anything about his dad. We don't know when this book was written, although we have some guesses. And that's kind of where I want us to start. It's just the little bit that we do know, um, so that we can, as you go through this whole series, I want you to begin to get, get an idea of what was going on in this time. And so if you walk away from this and say, you know, at this time period, it really, it's from about... 1,000 B.C. to uh, zero to the coming of Christ. That's kind of the, the time of the prophets. And then there's this short uh, few hundred years before Jesus that nothing is written. And it's all kind of muddy to us. And sometimes I forget that. So my hope for you is that of the course of this series, it gets a little less muddy. Maybe not in the course of one sermon. It might, you might walk away and say, I'm not sure. Okay. What I want you to remember is there uh, are three really big events that happen uh, from about uh, 800 to about the year 300, and that's when most of these prophets are writing, okay? There's uh, these 12 prophets are writing during about this time, and there are three major events. The first one happens uh, probably uh, in the first, uh, uh, we would probably say in the 900 BCs, okay? The 900s BC, not the 900 BCs. Uh, and it was, there is a civil war and Israel splits. So during all of the prophets, when they talk about uh, the nation of Israel, they're actually talking about a civil war happened and part of that nation became the north, the, the, the nation of Israel. And part of that nation became the south. And that was the nation of Judah, okay? So there are 10 tribes that went with the north in Israel, and then there are two tribes that went with the, um, the southern part of Judah, the tribes of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. Now, when they refer to these, they're going to refer to these as, uh, they're going to refer today to the southern kingdom as Israel or Zion, okay? Actually, or Jerusalem or Zion. So when you hear that word Zion, that tells us that he is talking about the southern kingdom. He is making this prophecy against or to the southern kingdom of Israel, and it is sometime after this civil war has happened. So it's very early, I believe, in, uh, in this time period. I think this book is written around 800 or so B.C. It's a very ancient book. Now, one thing that makes me think this is because 
we know a little bit about another book, the book of Amos. And Amos starts off quoting Joel. And I'm going to show you this real quick. In Joel 3.16, uh, which is not going to be a t-shirt. It's not going to be a t-shirt. Do not make a t-shirt. Daniel, don't make a t-shirt. The Lord... Man, I can't get that out of my head. I just saw it and I was like, man. The Lord roars from Zion he, and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold of the people of Israel. So that's what the, the book of Joel says uh, in chapter 3, which is the final chapter. And Amos starts off his book or his letter, his prophecy, saying, And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of of Carmel withers. Now, he quotes verbatim, word for word. We see either Amos quoted Joel, Joel or Joel quoted Amos. And I would tell you, because he starts it off, I believe he took that, which means we know Joel was probably written after Amos. And we know about when Amos was written. Amos was written uh, to the southern kingdom in around 750 B.C. And so before this, I believe that's one of the main reasons. I also will tell you when I read it, you don't hear anything about Assyria or Babylon. Those are the two other major events. Is There's going to be two exiles. Why two exiles? Because there are two countries. So the northern kingdom is going to be exiled in 721 by the country of Assyria. And then the southern is going to be exiled. It's going to be besieged and exiled in 586 by the nation of Babylon. And so Joel doesn't even hint at these exiles or these wars coming. And so that that leads me to believe, even though he's going to be prophesying about them, he doesn't have the the, the foreboding details uh, that some of the later prophets might have. He doesn't even know, apparently, that Assyria or Babylon exist. Okay? So that's kind of why I, I, I think it's where it is. And I also want to be clear, you're going to hear this word, Mount Zion. And in the news right now, you'll hear about the Zionist. Have you heard that word on the news, Zionist? And what it means is people who believe that God divinely wants the Jews in. Jews comes from Judah, the southern kingdom, that God wants the Jews in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the hill, the mountain that the temple was built on. And actually, there were two mountains. There was Mount Moriah, and then there was Mount Zion next to it. And technically, on Mount Moriah is where the temple is. And in the, in the middle of those two mountains is a small little valley. It was called the Valley of the Cheesemakers. And the Valley of the Cheesemakers was gradually filled in, and eventually the temple was built kind of on that valley between them. And now it just looks like one mountain, and they call it Mount Zion. They don't really refer to it anymore as Mount Moriah. This is the same site as we've gone through Genesis, where Melchizedek came out and and prophesied to Abraham. This is the same place where Abraham uh, sacrifices Isaac. So there's something special about Mount Zion, okay? And so... I'm not going to get into the political uh, ramifications of what we believe or what you think, but I just want to say there's something about when we talk about Jerusalem or Mount Zion, we're talking about this holy city, this ancient city, where God apparently makes really uh, uh, his, his appearances come more and more right around this place for some reason, okay? Now, let's jump into the book of Joel. Here's how I'm going to do this sermon. I'm going to read, it's three chapters. I'm going to read selections from each chapter. Then I'm going to explain the chapters. And then we're going to find the gospel according to Joel. And you're going to see that the gospel in all of these books, all of these prophets, all of these Old Testament books, The gospel of Jesus is so crystal clear. It's amazing when we dig in. And my hope is that you can kind of walk away knowing that the whole book, the whole Bible, every book in it is about Jesus. So let's start off. And I'm going to start reading through some of the passages of Joel to give you a a kind of an overview. Joel chapter 1. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. 
What the cutting locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Chapter 2, verse 12. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He, when he relents, and he relents when uh, over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show the wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire, columns of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood and before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. We turn to Chapter 3, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. Let's pray. Lord, as we encounter your word today, words that we may not understand most of the time that we read it, we pray today that you will speak to us in a clear and a new way, that we will understand through the power of your Holy Spirit, not our own understanding, but yours. You'll give us eyes to see your word for us today. And Lord, as we gather here to seek you, we do so with a spirit of humbleness, with a spirit, Lord, of confession that we are not worthy to be in your presence. We are not worthy to, to have anything to do with such a holy God. So we come here humbly in your grace, in your peace, knowing that you have made us righteous, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done. So, Lord, reveal that message to us so that we can walk in freedom, so that we can walk out of here knowing that we are your children and that you love us. Lord, give us eyes to see what you will have us see today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm going to try to just be clear as we go through this, but I do want, uh, hopefully, you to get some excitement. I know uh, it was riveting what I just read, right? All of y'all, nobody's eyes glazed over. All of y'all, the excitement was getting. I could, I could feel your passion for this. I'm right there with you, okay? So here's kind of, uh, I'm going to explain the, the book a little bit, give you eyes to see what kind of is going on. The first chapter is written about the past, okay? The near past for Joel. So chapter one is an event has just happened in the near past, and Joel kind of describes it as a warning shot. We need to open our eyes. Something just happened. And then we're going to look to chapter two and three. They are in the future, and I kind of think about the future from Joel's perspective is kind of like the, the future from a child's perspective. If you were to tell your child, hey, someday you're going to go to college, then you're going to get a job, and then uh, you're pretty much going to retire and die. That's pretty much what's going to happen. Uh, from a child's perspective, it's like all that happens, is, wow, that's all going to happen pretty, you know, somewhere out there. And it's not, the time isn't really clear, but when you're living a life, you're like, oh, thank goodness that college and retirement, that's like can be 50 years, 60 years, we hope. We hope there's a, a lot of span. And so, like for me, those are so separated. I think about college as in far in the past, whereas a child would think of, ah, it's just all in the future, okay? So from Joel's perspective, when he talks about the future, it's just all in the future. But as we have uh, seen, some of these things are in Joel's near future, some of these things will be in kind of the distant future, more of the time of Christ. And then some of these things are going to be in the future, like are happening to us right now. And then some of these things are even in our future. So we're kind of at a point in this to where uh, 
we would say when he's talking about the future, he's talking about things in our past, but he's also talking to us in our day, and he's talking about our, our future as well. So is that clear as mud? Okay, good. All right, good. That's, that's all I can hope for, okay? So that word future, t- chapter 2 and 3, sometimes we'll be referring to, uh, to what I think is the Assyrian siege that's going to happen, but Joel doesn't see it quite as clearly as the later prophets do. Sometimes he's going to be talking about uh, things that are happening about the time of Jesus, where Jesus clearly says, hey, they're talking about me, all these prophets. And then there are going to be some warnings to us today that we need to pick up on. So the first thing is, let's go through chapter 1. This is in the past. It's past tense when you read it. And he's going to talk about the judgment of God that has just happened to his area. He says, hear this, elders, you elders, give ear to you in the heavens of the lands. Has anything happened in your day like this happened in the days of your father? Have you, have you ever seen anything like what we just saw? Whatever they just saw was a, a cataclysmic event for them. It was something that they're like, I cannot believe that this just happened. And what happens, he says, you're going to have to tell your children and your children and your children's children and everybody. You need to let them know what just happened was from God. And he says... What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. So he's talking about a plague of locusts that came through, physically came through. This is not an allegory. This is, they just had a swarm of locusts come through. And so when this happens, he's saying we need to open our eyes. And the people would have known this. If you know anything about the history of Israel, that one of the ten plagues was a plague of locusts. In fact, it was the eighth plague. In other words, it was at the end when God was trying to really make a point. It was so strong that when Pharaoh encounters the plague of locusts, he goes to Moses and he says, will you get this plague of death away from me? And it's only the plague of darkness and the plague of killing all of the firstborn that, that is worse than this in kind of the progression of the Ten Commandments. So this is a big deal, and it's a biblical deal. In the law in Deuteronomy 28, uh, they're going through, uh, as they recite this, they're, um, they, they start reciting blessings and curses. And two of the curses uh, are this in Deuteronomy 28, 38, you shall carry much seed into the field. And shall gather um, in little, for the locust shall consume it. Deuteronomy 28, 42. The cricket, which is another word for locust, shall possess all your trees and the fruit of your ground. So these people know that this plague that just happened wasn't just a coincidence. It wasn't just bad luck. That they were, for some reason, they were judged by God and the locusts came. Now... Now, the devastation of a a swarm of locusts to us, we're like, ah, if I gotta have a plague, basically it's a bunch of crickets, it's a bunch of grasshoppers, basically, is what it is. It doesn't seem that bad. Let let me tell you, he kind of goes from the pendulum to pendulum to kind of show how bad this is. He starts off with all of the drunks (laughs) that were affected by it. He says, Awake you drunkards and weep and wail for all you drinkers of wine because the sweet wine, it is cut off from your mouth. In other words, all of the vineyards died and if you like to drink a little bit of wine or a lot of wine, you got nothing. It's dry. You don't have. So all of the the drunkards, this is so bad, you're not going to have any. And then he goes to the other pendulum uh, or the other side of the, the pendulum and he goes to the priest. And he says, the grain offering and the drink offering are cut out from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn and the um, the ministers of the Lord. They can't even take the grain offerings in. They can't take any drink offerings in because all of the plants have died. They've been consumed. And so we can't even go and worship the Lord the way we're accustomed to, to worshiping the Lord. This is devastating. And then probably the worst uh, thing that was affected is for us Texans, the barbecue was affected. Everybody says, what? Are you kidding? It says in verse 18, how the beast groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. There's no, there's going to be no food to eat, no brisket. Oh my gosh, it's rough. It's rough. It's rough. Everything is dying, and some of us are like, oh, I mean, it's just grasshoppers. And by the way, this is, is not cicadas, okay? 
It's a weird story, but all, we misidentified cicadas here uh, as, uh, as locusts. Locusts are grasshoppers. They are grasshoppers, okay? And so when we think of this, we don't think of it as a big deal. So I want to show you the means of judgment and how God kind of did this. I'm going to show you the first picture is a picture of Morocco in 2004. Um, in 2004, a 142 mile long swarm of over 69 billion locusts. Uh, and it just encompassed the, um, the country. The next one is from 1915. This is from the National Archives. This was in Israel. In 1915, there was a swarm. This is the tree, a tree, uh, and then right after a swarm of locusts, this is the same tree. They devoured everything on the tree. Uh, and now, I, I'd actually, as I tell you some other really uh, um, interesting facts, I, I was watching Planet Earth a few years ago, and this scene stuck out to me, so I'm just going to roll a video of locusts. A swarm of locusts can be 160 million locusts in one square mile. One, one million locusts will eat more food than 5,000 people can eat in a day. They swarm over, uh, one of the quotes from National Geographic, they can swarm over an unguarded infant and devour its eyes in a matter of minutes. Now, hopefully this never happened, but we can just see that this is devastating. Okay, this is a horrific event that happens, okay? Some of y'all are going to have nightmares from church today, and some of you, hopefully, are going to get on your knees and say, Lord, I repent, whatever I do, I, am, I don't want it. Now, what I want you to take away from chapter 1 is Everyone in this region would have seen this plague and would have said, oh, this is biblical. This is something that God said would happen. We need to, to open our eyes and, and begin to listen to whatever this prophet is going to say. Whatever God is saying to us, we want to, to be oh, our Warning shots have been fired to us, and it was a big deal. So we go on to Joel chapter 2, and it is looking to the future. And he's going to talk about this thing called the day of the Lord. It says, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness like blackness. There will be uh, spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. There, ne there has never been anything seen like it before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Seventeen times in the Old Testament we hear this, uh, the, this phrase, the, the day of the Lord. Five of them are in the book of Joel. It is the theme of the book is there is this day of the Lord coming. And he is warning them in their near future something worse than locusts is coming is what he's saying. And then he's also talking about just people in general, but then he's going to be talking specifically to us. In fact, some of us are going to uh, lean in and be like, oh, this is amazing. Some of us are going to lean out and say, there's no way. There's no way this is talking. This is kind of how prophets always, it's vague enough. We can say, okay, maybe. And then he's going to be clearly talking about some day of the Lord coming in the future. Okay, so it's the, it's the future, but it's all of us and it's speaking to us, okay? And what we need to know about us, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, is this. When there is disobedience to God, punishment is righteous, okay? When there is rebellion against God, a just God will always make sure that sin and rebellion is judged. This is a good thing when we look at what a good God, God cannot be good if he just lets evil and rebellion run rampant. And so there is a day of the Lord coming in which God is going to judge all things. And it's going to happen to them in their near future. It's going to happen uh, at several times again in these exiles. It's going to happen as well to us in our day. And there's coming a day where nobody escapes it no matter when you live. All right, so let's just focus on modern day. If you are a prophet in the year 800 BC, and you had a vision, remember that a lot of times they're called seers, and this vision was of modern warfare, of modern things happening. How do you describe it to the people at the time? Do you think, oh, well, there are these Apache helicopters, or you'll, you'll figure it out, and then there are these, it would have no meaning, right? So Joel is going to use language that is understood by his people, 
But he does not say it's going to be horses. He says it's going to be like horses. In fact, no uh, theologian that I could find actually thinks he's talking about horses. They all say he's talking about something that is like he uses this simile language that it's like the things you know, but it's not what you know. It's worse. There are several of these, if you read through Joel chapter 2, you'll see when he starts talking about it's going to be like this. And for us, it's so much clearer of what that could be than what he thought. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like war horses they run. As with the rumblings of chariots, they leap over the tops of mountains. So it's like horses, it's loud, they rumble, these things rumble, and they're like horses, but these are chariots that can just go over mountains. Not peculiar. It's very peculiar. And as with the, the, um, they go over mountains like the crackling of a flame, they devour the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. In fact, some of the other things I'll just tell you he says, he says, it's like when they go in the, the Garden of Eden's in front of them and everything behind them is just laid waste and it is a desert. Anywhere these things go, that anything's behind that's nice in front of them, by the time they have gone past it, it's just devoured. He even says that some of these things have a flame in the back and they shoot fire from the front. It's so fascinating the amount of weapons that we have that, is, that could be described in this. So what I would say is, He's kind of saying, well, God judged us with a locust, but there's a day coming where he's going to judge with wars and he's going to judge with, with, with other men and with armies, okay? It's future judgment is coming, but it's not just in our day. It's also coming for a day in the far future. Some of y'all hopefully are intrigued enough to read Joel chapter 2. It's fascinating. Joel chapter 2, verse 30, And I will show wonders in the um, heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and smoke, columns of smoke. This reminds us of Revelation chapter th- uh, 6 as well. It says, When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black. Joel said that earlier in chapter 2. A sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by, by a gale. The sky vanished like the scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So there's this Parallel judgment going on in chapter 2, and it's talking about the people who rebel against God in 850 B.C., the people who rebel against God in 2024 A.D., and the people that rebel against God at any time at the end of the earth. They will stand before God, and they will be judged on the day of the Lord. All right, we got seven minutes, so we can end there, or we can keep going to the uh, to the um, the good news. I want to give you the gospel according to Joel. Okay, he's laid out. All of us are going to be judged, and this is a good thing. The day of the Lord is coming, and if you think that this is a, a bad, terrible thing, it is. It's going to to we don't even know what it's going to look like because even the language to us makes no sense to us because someday though I imagine somebody's going to be like, oh, I know what it means when he says all the stars are going to fire. Oh, we see that. You know this. We don't know what all all of these things mean, but they didn't know what it meant for a chariot to jump over a mountain. Okay, but he's going to give us. The gospel, about as clear as you can give the gospel. In fact, the New Testament writers see this very clearly. The first thing, how do we respond to the coming day of the Lord? The first thing is this. Today is the day to repent. Today is the day for us in our day and age to repent. This is what he says in in chapter 2, verse 12. Yet even now declares the Lord, return with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind, a grain offering, a drink offering for the Lord your God. They would rend or tear their garments, and this in the Bible is universal. This means that something has just happened. It is an expression of someone is so overwhelmed uh, by a situation that they cannot handle it. So they just tear their clothes, and they usually just stay there. This is what Job, the, um, uh, the, um, Job does in the Old Testament, in the book of Job, when he finds out ten of his kids have just died on the same day. How do you respond to that? You tear your clothes, and you sit down, and you just sit there. This is when you have nothing to do. You just tear your clothes. And Joel says, listen, 
You are not going to tear your clothes and do an outward expression. You're going to tear your heart. You're going to rend your heart. You're going to break your heart for the rebellion and the sin that you have done. And you are going to turn to the Lord. You are going to turn to the Lord. You're not going to bother with theatrics. You're not going to grovel and say, I'm the worst person. You're just going to say, I can't believe I did this to my great and powerful creator. How could I do this? And you're going to turn. And it says, listen, he's a good God. If you turn to him, if you run to him, it says he will forgive you. He is, he has mercy, is abounding in steadfast love. He relents when disaster comes. He will relent. And it even says, who knows, he may turn and and bless you. He may leave you a grain offer. He may do something even better because you have run to him. I've been on a on a um, mission over the past few months, and I'm going to keep it going to make repentance great again. That's my, uh, that's my new idea. We'll do hats. We'll do them all. Uh, they're not going to be red. It'll be on the Joel 316. Yes. Now, here's what I want you to see, though. When, they talk, when, when Joel talks about repentance, he doesn't say, you know, all those bad things you did yesterday and, and the week before, you need to go pick up all that guilt and shame, and you need to tell God, oh, I'm such a bad person, I'm the worst person ever, and then you need to like, yeah, just, I'm sorry for this, and I'm sorry for this. When we, re- when we repent, we turn and we run to God. That's what it means. It does not mean you pick up all of your guilt again and say, all right, I did it again. Here it is. No, no, no. You just turn. It's a new day. You just turn and run to God. You just say, God, I, I, I don't want to be here. I want to be with you. You just turn and run. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And Joel says, you don't have to get on your knees. You don't have to cut yourself. You don't have to punish yourself. He says, listen, all you got to do is listen. If your heart is truly broken over the fact that you have sinned against God, just run to him. Run to him. And, and so when we talk about this uh, repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Repentance is running to God. I want to hammer that in. And he simply says, listen, the day of judgment is coming, but I got good news. You can still run to God. Yeah. Run to God. Run to God. The second thing I want you to see is Jesus saves everyone who returns to him. Jesus saves everyone. Everyone. Y'all say everyone. Everyone, everyone who turns to him. Now, It says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will um, be those who escape. And the Lord has said among the survivors, um, it shall be those whom the Lord calls. God is going to find everyone who turns to Jesus. And you're saying, where does this say the word Jesus? I see the word Lord. We're reading into it, okay? I want to just point out that Paul quotes Joel chapter 2 in Romans chapter 9, 10, 9 through 13, and he, he applies this verse, the name of the Lord, to calling on the name of Jesus, okay? That is how Joel read this, I mean, that is how Paul read this verse. This is what Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the one who uh, believes, whose heart, for in one's heart, one believes and is justified. And with a mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the uh, same Lord Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is talking about Jesus. If you call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. But unfortunately, uh, like Anigo Montoya once said, you keep using that word, but I don't think it means what you think it means, okay? Listen, We use these terms, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What do we mean by saved? What do we mean by call in the name of the Lord? We we use these words and we misidentify what, what he's talking about. The first thing is this, saved from what? The judgment of God, okay? The judgment of God. That is what being saved means. But it is not just the judgment of God 
at the, some future time, way, way in the future. It's the judgment of God that comes from your daily sin, that keeps you from being the person you want to be in Christ. It's not just, when we talk about salvation, salvation isn't just, there's one word that Paul used, he used the word justification. Justification, the easy way to think about that is that's your get out of hell free, go to, go to heaven ticket, okay? When you call on the name of the Lord, you, you are immediately, eternal life is in your future. But when they talk about salvation, that is not what they're saying. They're saying that's a part of it, but there's so much more, and you're going to miss out if you don't get what so much more means. So when we're talking about being saved from what? We're being, first of all, every single one of us has sinned and is in danger of being eternally separated from God. But good news, the first part of calling on the name of the Lord and being saved is when you are saved, you are eternally saved. Just because uh, you called on the name and you believed, as Paul said, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be justified because you believed in your heart. You will be justified. That means you will be eternally secure in heaven because you believed. But here's the other thing. When we say that word call on the name of the Lord, many of us say, oh, so I just got to pray a prayer. I just got to do this one thing, and if I just call in the name, it's like a, kind of like a magic word. If I just magic say this word, then salvation, then I just get it. That's not what he's talking about. Understand when the Bible talks about belief or faith or any of these things that we talk about, uh, um, accepting Christ, whatever, calling on the name of the Lord, what is being, uh, when we say that word belief, it is not just in your mind a thought exercise. It is saying that I believe in Jesus as the Son of God who came in the incarnation, came to this earth as a man, a physical man. He died on a cross as a perfect uh, sacrifice for you and me. He was put in the grave. He rose. He himself raised himself from the dead, and he walked out of the grave. And it's saying, I believe that, and I believe he ascended. And right now, Jesus is on high. He is controlling all things. He is God Almighty. Jesus is eternal. When we say we believe on the name of the Lord, or we call on the name of the Lord, it is not a word we say. It is this entire repentance shift of my whole world has been flipped upside down because God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, died on the cross for my sins, and now he is sitting and he is in control of all things, and it changes everything about my life. I cannot be the same person I was before I called on the name of the Lord if I truly understand what it means. Calling on the name of the Lord is the same as repentance, I will tell you. Jesus says, his first thing he says, his first sermon in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, repent for the kingdom of God is near. That word repent is the same thing of call on the name of the Lord, call on me, turn your whole life around and live as if God Almighty came to this earth, paid for your sins, and and now is in control of all things because he rose from the dead. That is what it means when we call on the name of the Lord. It means that our whole life, we now, yesterday, got a whole bunch of men together, and we, uh, we said we're going to try to start a new practice of every day getting in silence and surrendering our day to Jesus. Just surrendering the day before we open the Bible. And I have this vision of the men of this church of just going into daily repentance. That's another word. Of just daily saying, this day I'm laying down my life and I'm calling on the name of the Lord. I'm surrendering my whole day, my whole life to Jesus. That is what we mean when we say call in the name of the Lord. It is not a one-time thing that we do one time. It is a radical life change. The more you know about what the Bible means about salvation, the better it gets. Because here's the next part of uh, when we talk about g- being saved or, or calling on the name of the Lord and being saved, is the Holy Spirit transforms all who surrender or call on him. The Holy Spirit will transform your life when you turn and run to God. Now, again, you look at this, where does it say Holy Spirit, Joel? I just think you're pulling some of these things. It's not me, it's Paul. Blame Paul. <laughs> There's a moment after Jesus is up, and when Jesus is about to be crucified. It's before he's crucified. He's with all his disciples, and they're like, this can't happen. This can't happen. We need Jesus right here. And Jesus four times says, it's better that I go. 
It's better that I die on a cross. It's better that I go into the grave. It's better that I rise from the dead because when I rise, I'm going to ascend and I'm going to send you a helper. That's the promise Jesus made is that you are not going to do your life in Christ alone. When you truly say, I am, I am following Jesus, my whole world has been flipped upside down, he sends us the Holy Spirit. And the first time we see it happen to the church is at a place called Pentecost. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon all of the believers, all of the disciples who are there, and they start speaking and, and hearing languages. And so the one person can preach and everybody can understand. And the people are like, this is so crazy. And the people walking by say, man, they must be drunk. They must be, you know, just they're, they're out of their minds. And Paul stands, or Peter stands up and he preaches. And what does he preach? He quotes Joel chapter 17, or chapter 2, verse 17. In the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show the wonders in heaven and the above, and the signs on earth below, the blood, the fire, the vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood." Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. When Peter re read the book of Joel, he saw this promise that when we are in Christ, when we repent and we are running towards Jesus, the Holy Spirit will be there to infuse our every day. And when we stumble, we'll be less likely to stumble again because every day that we surrender, every day that we live a life of repentance, just running towards Jesus, we're going to be more and more transformed. The next part of salvation is we're justified. But then that's when the best part, that's just the, the entree, or that's just the, the hors d'oeuvres. The, the best part is the transformation, your daily life. They call it regeneration is what the theologians call it. Sanctification, these things that happen after when you're just running towards Jesus and you begin to see my heart used to, used to be full of anger, used to be full of rage when I think about that person. And now my heart is being turned because I see the love of Jesus everywhere, what he's done for me and how the Holy Spirit changes my heart. I'm going to go ahead and invite the band up so that we can get out of here before 3.15 or whenever the Cowboys start. I'm just kidding. We got plenty of time. He ends this by saying, Peter changes a little bit on the end of this quote. He says, the great and magnificent day of the Lord. He points to this, Lord, this, this day that Joel said was going to be terrible, and he says it's going to be a great, magnificent day. I kind of think about it as uh, anybody watching the Cowboy game last week uh, was a terrible, horrific day for most of us watching that game. But if you're a Saints fan, it was a pretty good day for you, i got to admit. We put Kevin Gebhardt away. We, we didn't let him in today. So, no, yeah, we tried to bar as many Saints fans today from this service. Uh, we're going to do that every year from now on when they play. But it just makes me think so much about how when we truly, truly understand the day of the Lord, that it is coming, we have a choice. We can be prepared, and we don't prepare in a day. I was watching a football game yesterday. My Longhorns were not on TV yesterday because they wanted to save the carnage of watching them destroy another high school football team. And uh, I was watching this uh, another college game. I was watching Michigan play UFC, U, uh, uh, USC, and... USC is winning. There's about seven, five, six minutes left. And it's in Michigan. And Michigan is just utterly, they're just, they can't believe they're losing. They're, they've already lost to Texas, right? And so it's, uh, it's this thing. And I just see everybody in the, in the place, they're all discouraged. And then a funny thing happens when they get the ball with less than two minutes to go. Y'all didn't watch this game, I can tell. So I'm going to, okay, okay. And so it was amazing to watch the game because all of a sudden, everybody in Michigan, even though they were losing, even though that, that countdown is going, they know we're about to, to lose this game. This is not looking good. But there was just this feeling when they got the ball back with under two minutes where the crowd is getting excited. And even though the time is ticking off, the crowd just begins to, to kind of act as if they've already won it. And I'm sitting there watching. I'm like, man, it feels as if they've already won this game, and they're, they're not even past the 50 yet. And I just start watching them drive down the field. And then eventually they end up winning, like, like 30 seconds left. They score, and they go ahead, and they win this game. And it was just an amazing thing to remember that they're sitting there with five minutes left, 
And time is ticking down. The day of the Lord is coming for them. This day is coming. But because of every single, there was just this moment when they realized it's not this one thing. It's every single day when we get up and we train, when we get up and we practice, every day when we are doing this thing, all of a sudden it just clicked. And it was just amazing to see that we, even when they were behind, they could see the end of this game and they had already won it. To me, that is a picture of how we should think about this day of the Lord. Every single one of us is a sinner in need of grace, but Jesus is a great God. When we, in just a moment, sing, we're going to sing, Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's stand. Let's worship. Let's worship.